I think, <laughs> can understand English better than me, probably. And so, um, just want to say, uh, this is the second day of, um, uh, for, you, uh, for those of you that were not here yesterday, this is the second day of our workshop about semantics, theory, technologies, and applications. And today we're going to have two different um, speakers. In the, in the morning, we have Mathieu Dacan, which will talk about, in general, um, semantic web. And uh, in the evening, uh, we will have Massimiliano Ceramita, who will talk about um, entity linking, more or less. So let me introduce you our first speaker. Uh, Mathieu Dacan is a researcher fellow at Knowledge Media Institute in the Open University in uh, Milton Keynes UK, in the UK. And uh, he got his PhD in artificial intelligence from uh, Laurier Laboratory in the Nancy uh, University in France. And his main research focus is on semantic web and especially methods for, and tools for building intelligent applications relying on formalized knowledge and distributed online. And he also researches on infrastructures for building semantic web applications, ontology life cycle, and semantic technologies for medical application. He is currently an associate lecturer uh, for the course of Natural Intelligence, Artificial Intelligence, and director of the 10th semant uh, Semantic Summer, uh, sorry, Semantic Web Summer School. So let's thank our speaker. <laughs> thank you. Um, Hi, and thank you for the introduction, that was very nice. Um, and thank you for being here. So, um, well, I'm, I'm here to talk about semantic web and I had it linked data technologies. So I don't know how much you know about these things and uh, how much I should go into the details. Uh, but basically I will use semantic web and linked data and I will tell you in which way I see how they relate. But generally for now we can say that they do relate. Um, now, the thing about this presentation is that, well, semantic web technologies are a tiny little bit difficult to present in general because a lot of them are fundamentally rather difficult and complex at a certain level. But in reality, using them is, uh, well, the point of having semantic web technologies is that they should make, make the processing of information and the processing of data and the processing of knowledge much easier. So I could have made a, a, a very complex and difficult presentation on the, well, uh, formal parts of description logics that are the foundations of some of the ontologies, but I didn't do that because I think what is more important is to understand what these technologies do and how they can do that. Um, so, if you are really interested in the formal and uh, complex uh, I, uh, aspects of description logics, then you can speak to someone else later. Um, but right now, what I decided to do is to show you through a lot of different examples how these technologies actually are applied and how they work, without needing to go into the details, but showing you how they make it easier. So I will basically, you can see the presentation as a kind of increasingly sophisticated uh, enumeration of examples where semantic web technologies are kind of useful. Uh, and because, uh, partly because I'm lazy and partly because I'd rather talk about what I know, most of the examples I've taken come from, well, things we have done in, uh, in our group, in our lab which I will tell you a tiny bit more about just right after that. Um, but the nice thing about that is that it means I'm going to, to show you general uh, overviews of the sort of things we can do with semantic web technologies and how you know, we can add more technologies to solve more problems or to solve problems easier. Uh, but if needed, I can be asked both about the conceptual aspects and about the uh, technical aspects of actually implementing these things. And talking about asking, uh, I understand that I have complete freedom about the organization of these three hours. So uh, the thing is, I tend to go on and speak like crazy for very long times without looking at my environment. So I suggest that um, you try to interrupt me whenever you have a question and whenever you want more details about anything I'm talking about or if I'm going too fast or if I'm not giving enough information about something, uh, just interrupt me 
And if that doesn't work, I will try to put some uh, pauses at some key points of, uh, of the presentation and possibly even have a break because that's going to be slightly long. Um, now, that's about the general organization. Uh, just to repeat what had just been said about me uh, and give you a tiny bit of context about all these examples I'm mentioning and all the things I'm going to talk about. Uh, so, I'm a research fellow at um, the Knowledge Media Institute of the Open University. I'm also French. Don't hold that against me. I, I, try, to avoid, I, mean, I try to get away from France. <laughs> I'm not that bad. I live in the UK now. I'm polite and everything. Um, I have a PhD in, in artificial intelligence, knowledge engineering, and reasoning. That's basically my main background. But moving away from France and to the UK, I, I started uh, building a lot on you know, this particular background, using artificial intelligence techniques and knowledge representation techniques for uh, web information and web information processing, leading to the semantic web and the use of ontologies. And uh, right now, putting a lot of focus on uh, linked data technologies, how we integrate data onto the web with specific applications into education, uh, personal information management, and privacy. So again, a lot of the examples you will see are things we have developed in one or several of these areas uh, using these particular technologies with always a tiny bit of focus on data modeling and knowledge modeling. Uh, I work in a research lab called the Knowledge Media Institute. It's nicely named because it's about knowledge media, the transfer of knowledge, uh, no, any kind of knowledge technology, any kind of new media technology. And um, so it's a medium-sized uh, research lab with about 75 uh, people in there with a lot of pro European projects, a lot of national projects, and a lot of collaboration with uh, large and small industries into innovative projects using semantic web technologies, multimedia technologies, and new media into all sorts of different areas, including manufacturing, education, uh, well, distance learning in particular, uh, learning analytics, and all sorts of different areas. And finally, the lab is part of the Open University. Um, and the Open University is a very interesting entity. It's the largest university in the UK. We have 250,000 students per year, which is kind of massive. And all of that happen at distance. We don't, students don't actually come to our campus. They stay at home and study at home. So 250,000 people studying university degrees from their own place, and once in a while coming to a tutorial, <coughs> is a very interesting challenge, which means a lot of what we do at the Knowledge Media Institute is targeting it in doing research in the technology that can help that, open and distance learning for very, very large number of students. It has been running for 40 years, so that's kind of rather successful. And it had a lot of different places, and actually, uh, it's not only for the UK. Anybody more or less in the world can have a degree from the Open University uh, just by enrolling into it. Now, the last bit I didn't mention at all about uh, this slide is th this picture over there, which is one of my favorite pictures of anything at all to uh, put in front of something called semantic web technologies and linked data. Um, and that is purely a parenthesis. This is um, a, a photo of a panel of what is called a Turing bomb. And a Turing bomb is one of the first ever computational device that was produced in the world. And it was <coughs> a very reasonably big thing, like, you know, like a big filing cabinet. Uh, which was used to decrypt German messages during the, first war, uh, the Second World War. So this was the sort of thing that um, was used in a place called Bletchley Park, which was a super secret place uh, located in a village called Bletchley uh, during, between 1940 and 1945 to decrypt the German messages. Uh, and Germans had absolutely no clue what was happening. And there are three reasons why I like that. It's called a Turing bomb because it was invented by Alan Turing. And anything invented by Alan Turing is cool by definition. Uh, 
I really like it because I live in Bletchley, which is the village where, village where it is. And Bletchley is not part of Milton Keynes, which is the city where the Open University is located. But also, I really like it because this image gives an idea of, you know, in 1940, the first ever computing machinery invented in the world was about doing large computation in large volumes of data using data that needed to be given meaning and by and doing that by introducing elements of uh, statistics into the German language and understanding of the German language to try basically every combination of codes for the, comp for the encrypting machine until it got something that looked like it was German. And that is pretty impressive because this is still exactly what we do, bringing background information into large data processing for, to, to make meaning out of it. And in that case, it's much more explicit because it's extracting meaning for something which is explicitly made to be meaningless, which is encrypted messages. Uh, it is said by official historian, which I didn't meet myself, um, that <coughs> because of this sort of machines and because, um, and because Germans didn't know uh, the UK had them, uh, the war was, the, you know, if we didn't add that or if Germans knew, the war would have been a good two years longer. So that's pretty impressive and nobody knew anything about it until the 1970s, which is even funnier. So that's the end of the parenthesis about this really nice picture. Uh, now, semantic web technologies. Let's start a tiny bit kind of slow about the semantic web. I guess you have heard about it, at least yesterday, if you were here. Uh, there, is a, there is a general idea that what we want is to have on the web information, to be able to publi publish information on the web and to use the web as a platform for knowledge sharing, where the information we put there is meaningful and where the information we put there um, is on the web, not as in his information in a document that somebody can read, but as in his information that uh, an automatic process, a machine or a computer, can actually exploit in one way or another. So the semantic web has been a, an academic discipline for a very long time, coming, taking its root into artificial intelligence and knowledge representation in particular, and having lots of things around ontologies and reasoning. Um, the reason I put linked data all over the place now is that at some point somebody decided there was something simpler to do. I mean, it was not one somebody, but it came at a trend. Something about using the web to share data, to connect data, and using the web as an infrastructure for data representation and graph representation. So there is this slight ambiguity and confusion between what the semantic web and what linked data and how they relate to each other. A lot of people will say linked data is one part of the semantic web. Some others will say linked data and the semantic web are exactly the same thing. And some others will say there is no point talking about the semantic web, only linked data counts. So to start with, I wanted to give you my kind of view over that. And I think, and I'm basically going to structure the whole uh, presentation around that. But first, uh, the other kind of tiny bit of definition I need to give is what we mean by semantic web technologies. <coughs> uh, that's actually a tough one. If you, this thing, I, a few years ago, I made it a rule that I will never have a presentation including this picture. Uh, that's the most rubbish picture you could ever find anywhere. Uh, and that has been a problem for the semantic web for very long. But now I've broken my rule, I've broken my rule just to explain to you what is exactly the problem of presenting semantic te web technologies. Um, that is called the semantic web layer cake. It is the idea to try to encapsulate in one diagram, in one way, how semantic web technologies work with each other and uh, how they build on technologies from the web to get into something which is more meaningful. And that has been promoted by Tim Berners-Lee, which happened to be the inventor of both the web and the semantic web. So in principle, he knows what he's talking about. Uh, 
to show these sort of things. Except the slight issue about it is that it doesn't really tell you anything about the semantic web technologies. It gives you acronyms and sometimes vague kind of notions of what they should do. But also it doesn't tell you what's the relationship between these things. You know, there is all over there. I know because I have some kind of background knowledge in the area that OWL relies on RDF schema, except this is not exactly true anymore. And RDF schema relies on RDF. I guess that will be true. RDF relies on XML. That is not true anymore either. Um, and XML rely on URI. That, that we are happy. But we remove XML in, the, in between. Uh, query, we, at, the, at the time this picture was there, we had no idea what it meant. Signature and encryption, we still have no idea what it means. Uh, rules over there, at that time was SWRL. Now it's not anymore. Um, and the rules in SWRL rely on all, but the new ones don't. And we have something called first order logic on the top. Not exactly sure we, this is where it should be or whether it should be all around or it should be there. That's a wrong picture. Actually, I have proof that it's a wrong picture because Benny made another one. Uh, which is kind of similar, but is not exactly the same one. Ah, and you see that logic got down, but proof and trust over there appeared. I think maybe this one actually came before the other one. It's all different version. Somebody made another one, which is a um, tiny bit different. Encryption has been kind of summarized, and signature have been summarized into crypto. And uh, XML and URI are still here, that's for sure. Uh, RDFS and all over there. Rules are being transformed into Rift. Query, oh, we got Sparkle now. Unifying logic instead of former first order logic because we are not completely sure it's first order logic. Proof and trust still don't know what it means. And somebody made another one. Um, that's one version from Benjamin Novak, which basically said exactly what I'm saying now. Uh, this is all pretty rubbish. Uh, let's have another one that will be less rubbish. Uh, and by less rubbish, he meant more complicated. Uh, so you can see there are still a lot of things. Now, the formats, there are more than one format. It's more than XML. We are happy about that. Uh, URIs are still there. HTTP as well. Unicode, we are happy. He added authentic authentication. Now we have graph URIs as a proof bit. That I don't understand. I have no clue what it means. Uh, and we still have trust. Query, Sparkle. R rules are still rich. We are happy. There is some logic going transversal, and I still don't know what's the relationship between the different layers. So that was basically, you know, if, if you, I, I will hope you will not leave the room now because your conclusion of semantic technology will be, eh, we don't really know what it is. That's kind of nice. The point is there are a lot of them. There are a lot of different things that form a sort of ecosystem of different technologies. And trying to put them in a stack like this one as the exact technical technologies doesn't make any sense in a sense that, um, well, it really does make sense. Uh, it, re it is really useful to take specific technologies and try to organize the dependencies between them because they are meant to be combined and reused. And I think the original idea was to have a stack of technologies a bit like this one. This is the Aussie model of networking uh, technologies. So how a network or a kind of the networking stack of an operating system is organized in layers that go from the purely physical, which is there is some kind of network uh, card into your computer and there is a wire somewhere, which has a certain kind of thing, to the presentation, which is in the application layer. The application layer, in our case, will be HTTP. The presentation layer and the session layers will be uh, I, TCP IP. And then there will be the network layer, which is a way it's actually transferred into a LAN network or a wireless network. I think this was the reason why somebody thought, hey, let's have a stack. But <coughs> the main issue with it was we, this is an abstract stack. This is a stack where the concepts are presented, and the relationship between these things are extremely clear. Each going up in the stack means, um, means abstracting. Is if you go from physical to data link, 
it means that the data link doesn't have to care whatsoever what the physical bit is. The layer at the bottom takes care of it. It's not its problem. And it can be a lot of different things. It doesn't have to care. There is, it's co it completely abstract from it. Going down the layers means encapsulating. You take your HTTP um, data, puts it into an IP packet, which puts it into a TCP packet, which puts it into whatever else it needs to be put. So each of them just takes the thing and add the layer of information which is required to actually transfer it, which means you gain in transparency when you go up, you uh, gain in technicality when you go down. And I think that was the goal of having a stack, to try to do that. And one reason why it failed is that this, again, is a conceptual principle. It's not based on specific technologies. Trying to understand which technology fits where is not necessarily the idea. So <coughs> to solve the, all the problems of the semantic web, I made my own stack. And it's a much simpler one than, uh, than the one we have seen. Is, and, that, and that's what I'm going to use to structure the rest of the presentation. And that's starting with the three bottom layers. The idea to me of linked data and later the semantic web is that it is a way to abstract from the web architecture to use it in order to represent data, to share data and to publish data, to uh, abstract it. And there is a very good reason to do that, is that the web is actually a pretty cool platform. And if you think about it, the, all the technologies related to the web are actually in the stack we've seen before. They are somewhere over there in the application layer. HTTP is a protocol of the application layer, is the main protocol of the web. The nice thing about this idea of seeing the web as an abstraction for, from the communication uh, aspects of the rest, which in that case I call the internet, is, um, is that it gets this kind of abstraction property. The very good and interesting property of the web, the thing that makes it a cool platform, is that it is a, it is a, a network of documents. It's a network of, well, text and pictures and anything which are conceptually connected by hyperlinks. And yes, this network relies on the internet to get to this document, to find it, to retrieve them. But the network doesn't have to care about that. It abstracts from it. It's encapsulated in it. Which means that, and that again what makes the interesting property of the web, is that it's a global network. You can make a document that links to another document without having to ask anybody uh, essentially not the author of the document or whoever is hosting, hosting it on their servers, whoever is delivering it, to give it to you. If they do, you don't have to ask any permission, you just have to link to it. Because the only thing you need to know is the address of this document. And in, as long as you know the address of this document, and you know that this address doesn't, rely, doesn't need to know anything about what's going underneath. It doesn't need to know about the DNS server, it doesn't need to know about the particular machine there or who makes the document. You just, it's a, a network that abstracts from the, what we can call the physical layer of the web, which is the internet, to provide a conceptual layer of documents, a conceptual view of how we can create an enormous document base that everybody can share. The idea of linked data, to me, is to do exactly the same thing with data, is replace document by data and it's the same thing is the idea that, yes, now that we can put, encapsulate information into documents and put them at an address, and have an hyperlink that, takes, that goes from one document to the other, can we use that exact same mechanism to include data into these particular addresses and use the link to connect data? And that's why I think the linked data web is kind of a layer above. It uses the web protocols and it relies on it in order to, um, to create the graph, create the representation. But it doesn't have to, no, it abstracts from it in the sense that it doesn't 
it el eliminates the boundaries that exist between the documents. And uh, in practice, that means um, there are other things we can do. And that's an, uh, another important message about it, is the internet is clearly about connecting computers. The web is about connecting documents. And what you do with connecting computers is you make them communicate. What you do with connecting documents is that you browse, you read, and you search them. What you do with data has to be different. It has to be something else. It has to be extracting the data. It has to be abstract from the document layer because it is a, a, a different aspect. So what I wanted to do is go into a bit more into the details of what, what is really the basic underlying ID and the basic underlying technologies that make in data. Um, <coughs> and that the, the basic ID and the basic uh, technologies can be very well summarized by simply comparing it to what would be the lower level web. Again, the idea of the web is it's a network of documents. So you can have my own page somewhere which points to one course I'm teaching and uh, the website of my university points to a system at the Open University that points to the course and my home page also points to uh, my Twitter um, space, whatever it's called. Um, that's, again, we all know that. That's pretty obvious. That's pretty uh, evident. The important thing to remember is the nice thing of that, is that if we didn't have this global architecture and if we had to care about the lower level of technicalities about them, we will have to know that um, we'll have to know Twitter, we'll have to ask them. We'll have to know what exactly they use as uh, mechanisms to put anything. Here in that case, me, I can put my own page anywhere I want and I can start make it part of a global network of things which clearly have nothing to do with me and where I don't have to care what it is that they did over there in order to include it in the same network. And that's all down to having two simple principles for the web. Every document or every resource has a unique URI, a unique address, which <coughs> first identifies it. It means, well, it says this is a particular document, and it tells where to find it. It's allowing the lower level of uh, the internet to find how to ask the machine to actually provide it to you. Um, and it has a thing that is a standard representation for a link, an hyperlink, something that says, I'm connecting this document to this document by simply referring to the, um, the document's web address. Now, the nice thing about link data is that I'm almost done with the definition now. I just have to say that the whole idea of link data is using this exact same architecture, this exact same basic principle to represent data instead of objects, in the, instead of documents. The idea is very clear, very simply that we adapt the web protocol so that every so that we represent data objects, entities, things, like instead of my home page, we represent me as a person. Instead of my university page, we represent the open university, the organization, the, and a data object that represents this particular organization. And for each of these data objects, we assign URIs. And again, URIs that are meant to be giving an identifier for them, so there is a URI that represents me. And actually, there is more than one, but that doesn't matter. Um, there is a URI that represents the Open University. This one, I remember, it's called http semicolon slash slash data.open.ac.uk slash organization slash z underscore open underscore university. That is a URI that represents the thing, the Open University. It doesn't represent the document. And once we have URIs for representing things, we can make the uh, web protocol to deliver information about the things instead of documents. 
So we can have, you can go to the URI I just mentioned and actually get information about the Open University. Know that it's called the Open University, where it's located and what sort of courses it provides, for example. And all that providing the information is made out of exactly the same mechanism, the links. Which means if I have a URI for myself and a URI for my university, maybe I produce my, the URI for myself and the university produces the URI for themselves. I can put a link into my information that um, says that I work for this other organization. And that is basically the information I can produce. If you go to my URI, you will get a bunch of, well, RDF or XML or one of these technologies that will represent information about me as links to other URIs that represent all the other sorts of information. And the nice thing about it is, again, I might have created this bunch of information and all these links. I might host it myself on one web document on somewhere. And the organization, the Open University, might have done it themselves for, for themselves. But I can link to them, which means the entire graph that connects me to my university, to the courses, to a book, to the author of the book, to the place where they were born and uh, to their date of birth, is one common data infrastructure. It is going from one web address to the other through links that have specific labels. Um, and, and we don't have to ask anybody. We don't, it's not like my university has a database and I have a database and at some point I ask for a dump of their database and integrate it. I connect to their data which is directly on the web. Um, I don't know how much you have seen this already. That's another picture that in principle I should have a rule not to put ever in a presentation. Um, it's the picture of kind of who has done exactly that, who is providing data according to this basic principle, uh, which was collected some time ago. One of the reasons not to ever put it in a presentation is that it's completely out of date. Uh, the nice thing about it is that it shows that this is not just a completely stupid academic exercise to think that, hey, we could use the web infrastructure to represent and share data. This is something which is happening uh, in governments, in big companies, in, in universities. I think ours is somewhere over there, this little one in the middle. It's kind of hard to point to it, but uh, it's over there. And all of that, actually much more than that right now, makes an enormous graph of all sorts of interconnected information. And it's basically the biggest database that has ever been constructed because it has not been constructed. Because it's just made of individual uh, contributions from people that just put some data and connect to another one. And as soon as you can do that, then you get a whole graph that you can explore and use for your benefit without having to ask, say, the UK government for access to their register of schools in the UK. They have a URI for that. As long as, you know, if you want to know what schools are available in Bletchley, you just, you need to know the URI of Bletchley. Actually, to know the URI of Bletchley, you need to know the location of Bletchley. And as soon as you know that, you can ask, you can go and follow the URIs until you get to the location in the UK's government link data and uh, that will list links to the schools that are available in that particular place. That's all in one graph. So I still have to talk a tiny bit about technologies and I'm not going to go into a lot of details but just to basically give the very basic principles. As I said the whole idea is simply to use the web architecture to represent everything. And the, basic, the most basic element of web architecture and the most basic element of web um, technologies is the URI. So URI is, well, the thing we use in the browser all the time. This kind of thing. And as I said before, the whole idea of linked data is we use URI not as the location of documents, but as the identifiers for data objects. So this is a basic example of a, the URI of one course at my, uni, at my university. 
<coughs> it is a data URI. And the idea of having a URI to identify a course is like having a primary key in a database, with a global primary key valid on all the web. So the first thing it does, it, it identify it. It says, if you are this URI unambiguously talks about this particular object, every time you refer to it, it's going to be this object. So that means, and it's one of the interests of using web technologies. You couldn't have an identifier for a course which will be one or 33. It has to be a global thing. So the, uni the URI, uh, the uh, universal resource identifier, has this nice property of being universal. Now, this is an example of an HTTP URI. <coughs> and Link Data uses HTTP URI to have the two other properties of URIs. One is, if you know a URI, and if you know it identifies a certain resource, then you can link to it. So it's a place where having a URI is a way to connect data one to the other. So if I want to say I'm teaching this course, I can put at my URI data that, say, that puts a link between me and this course, this URI, or between my URI and this URI, that, uh, and I can label the, uh, the link by saying that I teach it. Uh, if, as a student, you want to say you, um, you took this course, you can do the same. You can go and put information about you taking this course. You don't have to ask anybody. <coughs> and this is um, a unique, universal way of saying, you know, if you want information about this particular thing I took, just go there. And that's the third property of your rise. It's an access point. If you go there, you get information about it. You get information about the topics it um, talks about. You get information about the fact that it's given by the Open University, uh, that it's given at a certain date, that it's at a certain level for a certain uh, type of students with certain requirements, and that actually you might pay for it. Uh, but that's kind of the thing we try to forget. Um, so it means that if I put in this that I teach this course in my URI, at my URI that I teach this course, then you can go into this course and know that I taught a course on a certain topic. You can also know that the university provides a lot of other courses about these particular topics. And that maybe another university actually provides a lot of courses about this or these same topics. Or that it's at a certain level or anything like this. So URI is basically the essential bit. It is the nodes of the graph. And the graph, I mean, okay, sorry. Um, and this thing, again, just going into slightly more details of this last thing of saying, then you can go to this URI and get information, is again a basic web principle. Is if you go to one of these URIs, I took a different one in that case, through your web browser, you will basically get a nice usual web document, an HTML page, listing all the information you have about it. But that doesn't mean that we just get back to the uh, web of documents. The, there, is there are interesting principles and uh, pre uh, techniques in, in web technologies that makes that you can have different representation for the same thing. And a browser <coughs> tend to say, what I like is the HTML pages, because that's what I meant to do. If you go to the same URI within a program, within a script, and requesting another kind of format, and in, in particular case, RDF represented in XML, then you get a data representation of it. Which means, again, the URI is used to identify and link, and it's also used through the basic technologies of the web, content negotiation and accept element and representation of resources, to provide the information. Which means you can build a script that take, gets from somebody and find all the courses they have taught and all the topics of all the courses they have taught, just getting to the URIs, taking the information and putting it somewhere. So in that case, this is actually a department in the University of Alto where you can get this XML representation and again, you can see, for example, that in this particular example, you will get an RDF representation that will just add links to the things this particular department teach. 
So that's uh, onto getting the information. And now, the nice thing about it is that it becomes completely obvious. Our data modeling is done on the web. Is again this extremely simple idea that since you have URIs to represent data objects, hyperlinks to represent connections between them, then what you do is data modeling by using these nodes and links as a graph representation for data, which means you basically have the web as a graph representation. And uh, that's the basic principle of RDF. RDF is a very simple data modeling format that is based on the idea of triples. It's based on the idea of building graphs. A triple is a thing that says this URI is connected through this property or this relation to this other URI or to a thing. Which means if you go to this URI over there as a course at the Open University, what you get is an RDF representation, which might be serialized in XML or in all sorts of other representation. Uh, but basically what this RDF representation is, is a list of links that go from this URI to, uh, to others or to uh, other things. So you will get straight away that say, um, this course has a certain title, a certain type, a certain subject, and it's at a certain level. And it's located in a place which is, happens to be in a completely different places. But if when you go to this URI, you will know that this place is France and it has a certain location in the map. So again, this is all simply to say this is absolutely basic and, and uh, no, um, simple things that entirely rely on the idea of abstracting of the, uh, the web architecture to use the basic mechanisms of access to URIs and URIs to identify things in order to model data. And the side effect of that is that we get the web property. The one that is, we get a graph representation of data which is global and universal. That, you know, you can use URIs that come from these guys which have, which have created URIs for any geolocation in the entire planet and uh, to, to say this is in France and once you have done that you can use the information these guys have about France and you can also connect to everybody else who have said uh, actually my thing is located in France which is a country and, um, and connect to them as well. The last bit of Link data technology, and after that I will stop talking about acronyms and things like this, is, um, is a querying bit. Um, it's, it has a kind of a funny status in the sense that it's slightly different from the others, but in the sense that the whole link data ID is then that if you have URIs that connect to other URIs, you just can jump from one URI to the other to collect all your information. Except that tends to be not convenient in any, pos in, in any scenario or in every scenario you might think about. So the piece of interesting additional technology is, is Sparkle. Sparkle is basically the query language of, of RDF. Now, as a query language, I would say it's not specially interesting. It is, I mean, the bit which is interesting about it and again, there are lots of formalization and a lot of people will tell me that it's super interesting because, oh, it's terribly complex and there are lots of inter complex, uh, interesting technical bits into it. But the reality is, it's a query language. It looks very much like SQL. Uh, it has a big difference with SQL is that it's made for RDF, which means it's made for a graph data model rather than a table data model. But apart from that, it's a thing where you can select stuff or construct stuff or ask for things uh, with certain constraints or certain conditions on these things. And you can use orders or stuff like this. Um, because it's a graph data model, the conditions have basically, are basically graph data patterns. It's basically asking for anything that will match this sort of template of graph 
in that case, uh, the topics of degrees at the, at the Open University um, and bind the variables. That is extremely simple and, well, extremely simple. It is not specially interesting in itself. One, what tends to be interesting about it is that, again, it uses this idea that we don't have to make the query language specific to the technology which means one major difference between Sparkle and SQL is not in the formality of the language, is that to query SQL, you have to be connected into uh, a database system. You have to actually enter the database system, enter the query into it, and actually get the result in a format which is specific to the database system. What makes a difference with Sparkle is that to query Sparkle, you need a web connection. And that's really the only thing you can have. You need a Sparkle endpoint, and the entire thing over the web will accept your query and return a standard data format, which can be XML, JSON, or anything which is directly exploitable standardly, without you having to know anything about the system which is actually executing the query in background. So actually, I can give you a quick example of that just to illustrate um, if I manage to connect. So that's the linked data platform of the Open University. So that's the one we have done. Just as you know, uh, the Open University happened to have been the first ever university to provide a linked data platform. And I can take this particular query and go to the Sparkle endpoint. Put it here and say, tada, go ahead, and get the result. So that means I go to a website, and I put a query, I get a result. That's interesting, but what is really interesting is, one, this interface I've shown is just there because I happen to be in a browser. This specific thing is, in fact, a service, a data endpoint, which follows a standard protocol for Sparkle well, for Sparkle pro uh, querying protocol, which you can use in any information, which means you can right now build an application that only needs a connection to the web to query all the information of the Open University or all the information in Wikipedia or all the information in the UK government. That you only need the web connection. This over there is actually a URI for the query, which means you can put this, take this, put it somewhere, and every time you will go to this particular URI, what you get is a result of this particular query. And that's again happening entirely over the web. And this happens to not even be a, a web page. It's right now an XML representation of the results, which means what you, the anything you can possibly need to have access to all this information, which end up giving you URIs for all the results which you can again follow and get for more information from, uh, is a web connection connecting to this URI getting uh, usable formats out. And you can use the same trick as before of using content negotiation to ask it in JSON or in RDF if you prefer that. That means, it has a, this very interesting aspect of being terribly flexible. You don't need to ask anything. It's, you, if you put data on the web, through link data, what you obtain is you make this data actually usable, independently of any technical aspect beyond using web standards, which is very convenient for a number of reasons. And, um, so now that I've given the basis, that's exactly the number of reasons that I'm going to uh, start exploring. What sort of things you can do with this? Uh, with this. And I'm, sorry, I'm going to give some illustrative examples of not only things that you couldn't do before, that now you can do, but things that you could do before, but it would have been so annoying to do. And now it's becoming too ob very obvious. 
And uh, my first example is always this one, because it's the absolute simplest illustration of what I mean by, uh, we could have done it before, but it would have been annoying. This is a very simple application that show a map. It's supposed to be an interactive map. Actually, I could show it to you. Um, of the buildings uh, the Open University has in the UK. So I said the Open University is a distance learning uh, university with a lot of, uh, of uh, students everywhere. But we have, we have a big campus located, uh, that must be Milton Keynes, right? No, well, this one is Milton Keynes. I can never remember which one is. I mean, I live there, it's terrible. Now I think this one is Milton Keynes. Uh, so we have about 100 buildings in Milton Keynes. And if I zoom there, I will see all the buildings uh, located in the main campus. In the main campus, it's a terribly boring place because there are no students whatsoever. It's only lecturers and researchers. It's absolutely terrible. Um, but since it's at distance, um, there is a model where students can enroll in regional centers and go to regional centers and still have a local uh, library and that there will be associate lecturers, tutors, people um, associated with all these regional centers which will give face-to-face -face tutorials once in a while or will actually have, which will represent the connection between the students at the university locally. So it's all distance but Distance means that there is still a point of reference people can go to locally. So we have 13 of these reg uh, regional centers. And of course, that means we have lots of buildings all over the place. Um, and that's a very simple map of where these buildings are. And if you click on each dot, it will give you the list of buildings at these locations. And if you go to each building, it will tell you well, what it is and what, you know, what, what there is to see there. And, um, whether there is a car park or anything like this. So again, it sounds like something that any university should be able to do, well, say, within a couple of weeks. Uh, that sounds very easy. One thing, one reason why I show it, I'm showing it that, is, I'm showing you that, is that this is based on the database of our estate departments, the people who take care of the buildings. And they couldn't do that, not even in a couple of weeks. The only, because the only information they have is buildings and their address and kind of what's in there, but they don't even have the information about the location. And it could have been done reasonably simply by trying to map the address to something else, like using Google Maps or using anything that will map the address to something. Within, as I said, a couple of weeks, integrating the data and integrating Google Maps and creating a new database that does that. This, as, this, the application, has no database on its own and was, bu was built in one hour. Simply because what we have is we take the database of the estate department and make, make it linked data, linked open data. Again, you can go on our website and you query for it or find the URI of a building and it will give you everything about the building. There was a good reason to do that is, well, wh why, why should we hide our buildings in, uh, in, in a database while the sort of thing our students tend to try to use once in a while. And even our lecturers, I, can, I can't tell you how many times I got lost in my own university. Um, and that all basically creates linked data from us onto what buildings we have and at what address they are. Now there is another organization in the UK which is a government agency called the Online Survey. They are the people who take care of <coughs> maps, of uh, knowing about the administrative area of, the, uh, of all the nations, uh, knowing where places are located, knowing about uh, what is the town, how many people there are, in what district uh, a town might be located, in what um, county this might be located, even in one country, uh, and all sorts of things like this about the administrative and geographic areas of the territory of the UK. And one of the very nice properties of the UK is that postcodes are at street level, which means our good friend of the Ordnance Survey have created linked data 
with URIs for every postcode, which means for every street of the UK. Which means, now that we have all these address, we just have to create this URI that follows a very simple template to order and survey, to know where this postcode is located, in what country, in what county, in what district, in what place, and to get this geographical location out of just getting a URI. Which means we can build our application by getting all our buildings from the uh, uh, Open University and getting all the locations from Ordnance Survey. Exactly as I said before, we absolutely no other data management infrastructure for the application than the web. We just go there and, and pick the URIs. And again, there is this, this is where this interesting property of not having to ask, being a global thing. By creating this linked data for our buildings and connecting it to Ordnance Survey, we basically created a new connection into the global graph, which means that also somebody could come and try to find out what is happening at this particular postcode and find out that there is the Open University and there is also Costa Cafe. Is Costa will ever want, oh, you don't know Costa probably. Uh, that's not the sort of thing that should be mentioned. Um, a Starbucks. Uh, there is no Starbucks there, but it doesn't matter. Uh, there is a Starbucks cafe um, just located in the same place, if Starbucks was ever to provide linked data. So that's one simple uh, representation of it. I have another application that looks kind of exactly the same. Um, and it's another illustration. This is a very simple application that shows where students having a specific type of interest, a specific profile, with respect to the sort of course they have enrolled to, um, come from. So we, are, we created profiles for students. We have a big database of which, to, uh, which student took which course. And you know, um, up to a certain point, anybody can take any course they want. Uh, and then eventually that makes them a degree. <laughs> and we have the database of the 40 years, last years of how that happened. Um, and so we created uh, profiles for our students to see, you know, that some of them seem to, well, some part of the, uh, uh, of the UK seems to be more interested in uh, things around childhood and youth and computing and ICT, while others might be more interested in things like science and the law. So it looks like more or less exactly the same application in a sense, and the same illustration, in a sense that you, what we do is we take the list of our students, we have their postcode where they live, and we know which course they take, and we just put that on a map because we have ordnance survey that tells us where the postcode is. It's a tiny bit more complicated, in a sense that, again, what is interesting here is that we just manipulate seamlessly all sorts of different data spaces as if they were in exactly the same place. So, because we have you know, students and the, the course they have taken, but what we want is to know the topic of the course. Well, funnily enough, we have Data Open AC UK, our link data platform that tells, you, tells us which topics they are actually taking. And it can actually tell us all the things about the resources that are associated with this course, the sort of things that could happen. And one interesting thing, for example, is that the uh, funding body of higher education in the UK now provides data about uh, the type of career people get out of taking a certain degree. So we could try to find out why these people took these courses because based on what sort of career they might have later. We can go to order and survey and get the district for the postcode. And that's how, what we plot because, well, basically, I check for my street, for example, in the entire history of uh, the Open University, there have been only 10 people taking courses at the Open University in my street, which is not, which looks like it's reasonable, but still, it's uh, considering that it's a big street and it's 40 years, that will not be enough for uh, aggregating and trying to find out why my street is very interested in uh, computer science or Italian, for example. Um, so we use order and survey, and then we re-aggregate the data 
into district, bigger uh, geographical information, because then we know the postcode is located in a certain district, which from my street happen to be Milton Keynes. And we, op we, we apply a clustering algorithm. Um, what's interesting is that once we have that, which means it means we actually have much more information also about the topics and we have much more information about the district. And the clustering we obtain is already connected into linked data, which means it's already an abstraction for everything we have, which we can reapply the same linked data principle to try to understand, for example, why these particular area seems to be par interested in these particular topics. What, what information do we have about these topics? What information do we have about these areas that can help us understand the uh, profile of students coming from these places? And the other thing is that it doesn't mean we have to put anything else as linked data. This thing is, well, our database of students uh, over 40 years. That, that we can't really give away. But that doesn't really matter. It's not the important thing. Nothing prevents linked data from linking from internal to external. We can have an intranet connecting to the internet. That doesn't make any difference. So that means we can transform that into linked data and connecting to the rest without necessarily having it to provide it to the rest of the world. So that means it's another example of how you can take data you have internally and by making it linked data, you make it processable even if you keep it private and keep it for yourself, as if it was in exactly the same space as all sort of other data, sometimes provided by very strong reference points, like the UK government. Um, so, and then as I said, I have a succession of other illustrative examples. That is another one where uh, what we did is we have a database coming from a, a certain a news agency that gives us information about when the university is being mentioned in the media and according to uh, you know, where a particular researcher or lecturer at the university is being interviewed by somewhere and somebody uh, or when some, one of our academics is part of a documentary or anything like this. We especially have very strong connection with the BBC which is the biggest broadcaster in the UK and the public one. Um, so that gives us data about our people and how they appear in the media. Now, the interesting thing is then again we can use the same data which is, and put it in connection with data about our people. So it, we can have data that says this guy, Nigel Warburton, was interviewed uh, on BBC Radio 4 uh, Yorkshire uh, on a particular day. And we have linked data that says this guy works in arts and humanities. Um, and that, so he was involved in the media. And that means, again, he, we have a lot of different data-related data systems that simply by putting into linked data that puts them together. Um, which also gives us more in the sense that then we can look at BBC Radio 4 and realize that it's a BBC related thing. You know, if uh, with BBC Radio 4 is owned by the BBC, which is something that DBpedia, the link data version of Wikipedia tells us. Which means then we could start querying our own data with views that come from others. We, we couldn't before query the data asking what, you know, uh, what does the BBC tends to care about? Because we had a lot of different channels and a lot of different ways in which the BBC would appear. Now we can say, what would anything which is owned by the BBC uh, care about? And having this information about what in our data is owned by the BBC provided by somebody completely different somewhere else. Here's another example about crowdsourcing, which I'm going to skip. And, uh, well, and another one where we have developed a mobile application where, again, this is a bit more internal, but the whole idea is, again, that in that case, you can go on your mobile phone and try to see what it is that you might want to take as a course at our university. And if you are not completely sure, 
you can click on related things and get all sorts of different things like YouTube videos and uh, related open material. It's another example of these sort of applications that should be possible without linked data, but with linked data, it takes only a couple of hours to do. And we have all sorts of others connecting to social platforms and connecting to mobile platforms again. So illustrating the, this idea that the whole thing about linked data is having data on the web in such a way that it uses a web architecture so that the data remains a global space. And we use a lot of what we create, but we use it in connection with, uh, with the others. And that this makes the creation and the maintenance of data-related applications much easier than if you had to do the data integration yourself. In a way, it's using the web as a data integration platform. You just have the, all the thing integrated. Um, which I think is a good time to have a tiny bit of a pause uh, before getting into, into uh, more detail on the kind of the semantic web layer. Uh, are there any questions so far? You have one. Yee Otherwise, it's not recorded. Um, it, it's okay. It's more about, in general, the view of semantic web. Everything in the semantic web is a fact that it is true, more or less. Uh, a street has a certain geolocation. Uh, a person works for someone in... Um, I think that one thing I, I still found that is just maybe missing or there are way around for that is that having more dimensions like time um, and also somehow a way to manage how um, the certainty of a certain uh, of a, of a certain triple, for example, let's say it is. For example, for time, uh, maybe now I'm working in some place. I've been working in another place before, and maybe I can need. I should need a way to express the fact that I work there in that time, and I work at, I work now in this other place. And for boldness, I think, for example, I can. Uh, I, I, would like to also express some things which I'm not completely sure of. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, a, um, a very interesting question and it's somehow going much further than um, the current state of linked data technologies. Uh, it's how you can qualify the information you have because that's what you mentioned is basically one part of the big paradox, which is... Um, before we had closed database system. And if we have a closed database system, we have a context for it. We know how valid the information is about it. We know whether or not it's up to date and it, it can have its own convention to tell whether the information is um, accurate, up to date, or to kind of, you know, at least put the assumptions behind it uh, and clarify it. Now we have an open system and uh, you might take it as meaning, well, that means that as soon as you put something on linked data, you assume it's universally true because there is no other choice. Um, and that will clearly be naive because it's not, mostly. I mean, most of what is being put on linked data is actually mostly wrong. Um, or you have to assume that there might be some assumptions into certain providers of data uh, that you will have to take into account at some point. But that's in contradiction with the idea of openness and abstracting from the provider of data. Um, because then you have, to, you have to assume that, there is a, that the source of the data is of relevance. Um, so, I mean, that, my unsatisfactory answer is that this is a problem that needs to be dealt with. Uh, and it's kind of putting a tension between trying to be, to put more constraints and trying to you know, put back into the application to take care of filtering and uh, scoring the data or making these assumptions more explicit at the data provider level. So there is an interesting uh, framework, for example, that um, 
some are trying to push now called Memento, which is the idea that to extend the web protocol to query for data so that you can at least take into account the temporal aspects. And basically, I have a canonical URI, which is expected to be the state of what we know about this thing right now, but that you can use similar things to content negotiation to query it for a date in the past or a date in the future and say, well, look, uh, I want to know the state of information for this thing three months ago. So that in that case, you can update the URI for you, saying now you work here. And uh, you can always go back to the state of the URI for you three months ago where you were working somewhere else. And that, that, that is one way to try to integrate this kind of qualification of data with context within the web protocol. Um, there are other proposals, especially at the data, uh, at the data modeling level, into adding things like you know, probabilistic logics into the representation of RDF, or temporal RDF, or any kind of this sort of you know, um, qualification of data according to certain contexts. Uh, the main problem with them is, again, this tension that what we want is something universal, is something that is always right, and the rep way to represent uncertainty or up-to-dateness or um, sort of bias is very hard to do universally. If you want to represent un uh, uncertainty with respect to probability, your probability has to have a context. And how you put this context into it, you know, saying it's 50% sure that, you know, I will be working tomorrow, um, cannot be interpreted outside of the way you evaluate 50%. So you can't really put that directly into the technology, which makes it uh, quite immensely harder. So another, another kind of, well, the, kind of, the, the other thinking about it, is that there should be some form, I mean, or kind of the middle ground, which, well, yeah, which is an interesting one, is uh, the top of the semantic web layer cake, which was talking about proof and trust, which is we can't assume everybody is saying everything which is right. So we need some form of meta-level reasoning about what the provider of a given information, what authority it has to provide information, and how much we can trust the information given, and how much we can trust it for to be up to date, for example. And that actually, I think, is, it is one of the uh, most promising um, direction, which is basically to annotate, uh, to annotate provenance of information in a linked data form, which is to be able to say, I got this URI, I got this information, I got this Parker endpoint. Now tell me how much I can trust the information, who is providing it, and whether give me the information so that at application level, I could set up a criteria which is global with respect to um, the, inf the way I can filter information I'm putting into my, my application. So there is currently uh, being made a recommendation in, in, um, in the W3C is a provenance vocabulary, which is exactly meant for that. To say, to be able to attach to linked data information, something that says this come from there. So that you can do the form of, informa or of reasoning, which means uh, if I get information about a school in the UK from Wikipedia, and I get information about the school in the UK from uh, the UK uh, Ministry of Education, probably I can trust this one more. Um, there are other bits of that, including description of data sources like the void vocabulary that basically uh, annotates a data source to say what it contains and what it has and what it links to. Not necessarily giving information about how much you can trust it, but in combination is basically trying to find a middle ground between it's all just a graph and nobody cares where it comes from. And uh, the application has to take care of picking the information from the right places by having the representation of the sources of information in between these two things. 
Yeah? Cool. Anybody else? Juhu. Should we have a, a, a quick break or, yeah? Uh, well, maybe five minutes. Okay, guys, a little, um, a little reminder. Um, to, um, today's uh, evening lesson is at uh, 14 and a half. It's not at, uh, it's not at 15, just to remind you, you know, if you don't, don't remember. So we can, I think we can start again for the second part. Please, Matthew. Thank you. So this afternoon at 2.30. Oh yeah, it's written 2.30. <laughs> um, okay, so for the second part, I wanted to get in a bit more into, well, a bit less into the kind of, is this working? Yeah, cool. Uh, into the lower level link data and get into the semantic web. This is actually one of my favorite slides. Um, that tries to explain what what is what I see as a relationship between uh, linked data and the semantic web. I mean, as we have all seen in the first part, there is this idea that you know data is a very useful thing. You can take a lot of data, and if we represent data as Lego bricks, blue ones in that case, well, the nice thing as computing guys, if you are one of uh, one of them, which I am is uh, that data are the building blocks to create stuff, especially applications. I, re I really care much about creating applications. And with data, you create stuff. If you take data on its own, like this one, well, you can create stuff. You can create a blue tower. And uh, the same data can be used for something else, creating another blue tower, or a blue house, or a blue car. What I was trying to express in the first part is that the idea of linked data is to, have, to use basic standard web uh, protocols to make data universally connectable so that you can you know, take whatever blue brick you have from uh, your own batch of Legos, goes to your, go to your friend who has yellow bricks, and ta-da, you can make 
a yellow and a blue tower. And then you can take you know, any kind of data from anywhere else. And you can build some, uh, well, you can build anything from this data. And this is all due to having a universal connector, a universal way to take some data which might have a certain form and color, and some other data which might have another form and color, and that, ta-da, magically, they work together without the need, uh, the need for you to put nail and hammer and glue into it. The semantic web is, is that, is this idea that you can have information and this information is connected, but that in the end what you build out of it makes sense. It is something useful, it is something that has uh, a meaning into it, that the connection is not random, is not something that um, isn't interpretable, is that when you take all these bricks together, it's a car. It's not, you know, you can see it, that it's form of, it's a, it's a model of a car. And uh, that's why I'm trying to express into link data is about making the building blocks of information uh, connectable so that you can actually build models out of it. The semantic web is about making sense of these building blocks and the way they connect so that whatever you construct out of it actually makes sense as well. And that's also expressed into kind of the extension of my previous stack, which is, well, we still have the web, and we still have linked data being uh, a layer on top of the web for data. The semantic web in that case becomes a layer on top of linked data, where linked data, the URIs, and the connections, and the links, are the symbols, are the elementary building blocks for, uh, for knowledge systems for things that are meaningful in some way. A URI is a symbol. The fact that a URI represents a course and that a course connects to a university uh, is, is the information that we are trying to get out of this. And that's where the semantic web is taking its role. It's to being able to formally and explicitly express this knowledge about the symbols in linked data um, in a way which is, again, exploitable for machines. <coughs> and that's the practical aspect of it. Um, that's the second time I put this slide that I shouldn't put anywhere. But it's to explain that the elementary idea, the intermediary way in which a semantic web has been uh, implemented somehow, and where semantic web technologies appear for the semantic web layer, is in what we call ontologies. So an ontology is this idea that you can express the abstract concepts and the abstract relationships that might appear in data. You can express that there is such a thing as a person, and then so that you can, you can express that a certain object represented by a certain URI happens to be a person. And then you can express in the ontology that certain properties apply to person, which means you can express that this particular URI, because it happens to be a person, has to have this particular property, or it implies that they will have these particular properties. So the interesting thing about ontologies is that they have mostly three roles in my view. One is if you relate linked data or web data into to relational database systems, ontologies are the schema. Sometimes we actually call them schema, sometimes we even call them vocabularies, but they basically set a structure onto the way the information following a certain ontology might, um, might relate with each other the way in which <coughs> these, these objects might be structured. What kind of links can you expect to get at a certain URI and, depend, and what type of objects certain URIs are. <coughs> the second one is this idea of 
expressing the meaning, expressing the, the structure so that this data becomes easier to integrate. It's the idea that an ontology should represent, so there was a schema and that is the vocabulary part. It should represent a way to have common, a common representation for something. So that if you go to a certain URI and get certain information, and if you use this one ontology for that, then somebody else using simi uh, representing similar information in another URI, using the same ontology, should be able to integrate the data, should make it connectable with your own data. It's a way to have a schema to represent a common, um, to, have, to be a common modeling, a common integrated approach to the modeling of certain types of data. And that's where this particular graph is important because there is this idea that then if ontologies represent the schema and the structure, <coughs> they should be, and in order for them to support the easy integration of data, they should themselves be represented within, within the web standard and the web uh, architecture. Which means ontologies are mostly this idea that you can build schemas, you can represent concepts, classes, types, and relationships between objects, the abstract concepts and relationships, um, exactly in the same way as you will represent uh, linked data. So that means, for example, that you can get to the URI of a person, and it will say somewhere, this URI is of type person. And exactly in the same way, uh, as before, this information will be represented by a link between the URI and the URI that represents a certain type person. In, it might be in a certain vocabulary, for example, called fourth. Uh, and that this URI for the type person, the class person, uh, is attached abstract information uh, into, for example, what properties a person might have. A person might know somebody, a person might have a name, a, a person might work somewhere. And all these properties um, are abstract representation of how you might want to model a person. And might be the links that are used within the URI that you got uh, originally. It might also say that a person is a subtype of agent or thing or animal. And, um, and give information about the hierarchy of things that are happening there. And it might, it might connect this particular concept of person, this type, into other concepts which might come from other ontologies. So in summary, what that means is that the two first one are very, the two first role of ontologies are very related with each other. The one that gives a schema, gives a structure, is a way to say, here is how you, what you can expect for an object of a certain type where you go to this URI. This is the sort of things you might expect to have in an information. This is a common template for representing this information for everywhere. And the second one is, if this is common and if all ontologies relate to each other, it means that we can start integrating uh, data in such a way that if I take a person from somewhere and I take a person from somewhere else, then I can process these two things in the same way because of them reusing the same ontologies or using ontologies that connect with each other in the same way and I can follow the links. The last one, the last rule, which is a bit funnier and, and comes more from the knowledge representation and reasoning background of ontologies is it can be used for reasoning. Um, and in the sense that this means that you, attaching an ontology means adding meaning in a sense of expressing explicitly what it is that you are talking about as well as giving some information of, about what you can imply, uh, imply about what you, you are talking about. A very 
simple and most common type of reasoning with ontologies is basic type uh, representation. If I have a URI which happens to be of type person, and person happens to be a subclass of animal, then I can imply that this uh, person, or this particular URI, is also of type animal. That might sound terribly underwhelming, but again, it ties the three rules of ontologies together, in a sense that <coughs> um, I can use the same example for a university. Um, if I have the URI of a particular university, and it says that this thing for this URI is of type university in a certain ontology, and this ontology says that university is a subclass of organization, in another ontology, and this other ontology says an organization has a person responsible for it, as a head of the organization, then I can imply that my university, the original thing I was talking about, should have a person as somebody responsible, which means whoever is responsible happens to be a person. Um, and that's the kind of, you know, how the three roles work together. That was for a very long time the main focus on any research and technology on the semantic web. How do you represent the meaning of things that might come from different places? And how you connect this representation of meanings across different uh, areas? Um, but I basically don't want to get into the details of how these technologies actually work and how they are created. Um, I think you can find an awful lot of information about that. Uh, I will go instead straight away into how you can actually use them in concrete scenarios and what sort of examples, what, what it might enable to have not only linked data, but also to include ontologies on top of it. One of the, so here is one simple example. Um, there is a, a research project in, in reading history where basically mostly what they have done, I mean RED stands for Reading Experience Database, is they collected a very big database of any information related to somebody reading something. That sounds very complex and funny, um, but that's basically what they do. They go through archives and uh, libraries and anything they could find, and any time they, they see correspondence, diaries or books that says somebody has read something, they put it in a database. It becomes a database record. And it says what they have read, it says who were the people reading, and it says something about what it is the book that they read and at what time and at what location and what they actually said about it. So they might have, for example, the diary of Virginia Woolf saying that in um, 18, uh, 1929, she read Balzac and found it was horrible. Uh, that's what they have created. We got in touch with them with the idea that what we were going to do is put this database as linked data. Now the point of doing that is we want to put this information which happens to be extremely specific to them. I mean, there's nowhere another database of people reading stuff. <laughs> and put them on the web so that somebody else might be able to do something about it do some research into reading history or do some research into something completely different. So the whole point of that was first to try to understand how it is that we could model this particular type of data into uh, a web format, a graph format, a linked data format. And that means the first thing we need to do is build them an ontology. Try to understand how it is that we can model the different concepts and relationships that these things might have, which is basically what sort of, what types of objects this database is manipulating, and what's the expecting relationships between this, uh, between this type of objects, so that then we can represent each of these objects and these types through URIs and make these connections, these particular relationships or, uh, effective. So that, that's the sort of ontology we created, which is basically, 
we have something which is an experience of reading, which involves a document, is at a certain location, is uh, involve a certain person as a guy reading, and it happens that the, a person might also be the creator or the author or the editor of the document, and a location might be a city or a country. One of the important aspects of this is that this ontology, when I say we created it, uh, it's a lie. We didn't really create that because what, what this is, is the agglomeration of existing ontologies and the way they might connect. Um, there is a class document in a certain, in, in some, in, in a certain ontology, in that case it was Bibo, uh, which we just reuse as a standard way of representing documents, which means that every of our URIs will have the type document, uh, about documents, will have the type documents. And this ontology we reuse for documents expects certain properties for documents, like title. And in that case, the properties are taken from another ontology, which happens to be Dublin Core. So that means we will model our documents and use these particular properties to create our links between documents and title. And the same thing, the same ontology Dublin Core say that the author there is a property called creator for the author of a document and that should connect to a person. So we will use this particular property to represent information about that URI. Um, the important thing about saying that is this is, the ontology again is a way to say this is a structure. It's a bit like the entity association uh, diagram of a, 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 a database system. But it's also a way to say this is how we are going to publish, to express our different types of objects onto the web. So that if anybody wants to understand or wants to look into our documents and have a lot of other documents and don't care whatsoever about who read them, they can still use our database because we talk about the same thing in the end. We still talk about documents independently of the fact that we do all these other things. And similarly, if we want to see whatever happened in a particular city, we need, uh, by reusing an ontology from somewhere else, and by this ontology representing a common agreed meaning of what is a city, we can, um, we can move from, uh, from representing something which is very specific to us, the reading of something which happens to be within a, a certain city into whatever has happened in, in this city. And if somebody want, ever wants to collect information about whatever historical event might ever have happened in a particular location, they might not care about whatever else we say. They only have to know that what we are talking about over there is a city. So the ontology again is this intermediary, this vocabulary, so that whatever we put on the web is understandable by somebody else for the simple idea that the ontology represents the intending meaning of each and every one of the objects. Uh, you can see there is another interesting example here, which is one is very specific to this particular database is that it represents experience of reading. But again, an experience of reading is nothing else but an event that seems to be happening somewhere. So here by saying, we have our specific concept, we have this thing, experience of reading, nobody else, there is no other ontology that uses this class anywhere. But if we say that this particular class is a subclass of event, that means that every property and every aspect of events are inherited into this class, which means that again, somebody can go and look at it as an event, doesn't have to know that we put any more specific meaning into it. And it happens so that located in, for example, is, uh, is a property of events. So somebody can look at our data in, with all the other data on the web about whatever event has ever happened into a certain location without uh, them having to know the specific meaning of our event. It happens that Reader Invo, for example, is a sub-property of 
the agent involved in a certain event. Which means, again, if somebody is looking at or say somebody wants to know about all the people who have ever come across a certain place, then they can look in our data for events that involve a certain agent at a certain place at a certain time. And that means that we do have our specific database meaning, but by putting these different ontologies together and by reusing them and using them as a way to express what we mean by these different objects, some of them very specific to us, we end up be, uh, publishing data on the web which goes well beyond what it is that um, we wanted to do about it, or what in, in which becomes more exploitable and more integratable with others, which might have completely different data but that have some form of overlap in meaning. Um, it happens that we can also build kind of basic link data applications about it, and that's an example of the sort of thing we do with the researchers in this particular project, where we can look at a particular person, what they have read and what they have done, and then we connect that to DBpedia to find out in the ontology of DBpedia other people of the same type. And in that particular case, it turns out that, say, the, um, uh, Virginia Woolf was a person with bipolar disorder, so DBpedia tells us that in their ontology, this person is of that type. And then we can go back to our data and look for everybody we know who has read something which has bipolar disorder, which means we can, even, we can reconnect with DBpedia to get more information and this information to be at the level of the ontology, at the level of the type of objects they have, and try to make some, use some filters for extracting these uh, elements of meaning and creating new views into our data. Similarly, we can do these sort of things, that is, using the ontology to create filters and create specific queries into interesting things. So that's an example where what we wanted to look at is reading during the First World War. So we have information about all the occupation, what people did. Um, <coughs> And the occupation are connecting into an ontology that can allow to aggregate from you know, anybody who is a soldier, who is a military nurse, who is a commandant of the army, into as types of occupation which are more specific subclasses of milita being military staff. Which means you, you can start using this ontology as background knowledge and as a way to um, express queries which are on meaningful attributes of the, uh, of the objects rather than, in, uh, than on the specific representation of what is asserted in the data. So that we can query the data based on um, not only the direct information attached to your eyes, but information attached to the meaning of the classes of this URIs. Um, I have another example of this exact same sort of things where it combines again this idea of using ontologies as a way to share meanings and add background knowledge into the, uh, into the data we have. These, these are examples into uh, something that we happen to be doing a lot, which is web log analysis. Actually, not only web logs, but application logs as well. So it's this idea that you know, we have lots of logs from absolutely any, any kind of application and websites and anything like this. And we want to analyze that. We want to understand what's actually being done and what is going on. So one way to make the task easier is to put that into one you know, common ontology and to represent it via link data. And so to have an ontology is for logs, for representation of what's happening on an application or a log, on a, or um, a website. And what's interesting about it, about doing exactly that, is that somehow it does the first rule of ontology, uh, in the first and second rule of ontologies, which is 
if you have an application log in a certain format and in a certain representation which is specific to the system and you have web logs in the Apache log format then by transforming that and putting one common ontology that express the common meaning of these things which are these about events happening in uncertain resources you start being able to look at them commonly and you, can't, you, you just integrate them by having a common schema. It has the second and third aspect as well, which is if you start doing that, what you obtain is generic things about things have happened. But these things have a certain meaning by themselves. Some resources have certain types, certain topics. Some users are different from others. And the logs themselves don't necessarily apply, eh, eh, make that explicit. You can add to the whole process a domain-specific ontology, somewhere here, that express the more specific meaning of uh, the events and the agents involved in the logs, so that you can make domain-specific analysis within a generic framework. Let, let me illustrate that. That is an example of doing exactly that in a learning analytics platform. Here is, there is a, a virtual learning environment used by uh, hospitals in the UK uh, and based on a certain platform called Moodle and that produces logs about what people do in uh, this particular environment. And what people wanted to do is check how effective the platform was at making people and in that particular case, doctors being better at what they do, which in particular case, not killing people. Um, so the idea is we can take the logs of what's happening on the platform and represent them as event. And then we get agents and we can times and we get the general meaning of anything which might happen in the log. And we can start graphing that. We can show that specific things happen at specific times and that specific users uh, happen to be using some specific resources at specific times. Um, but then we can also integrate into that the, uh, uh, some kind of background, uh, background knowledge that says that we actually have subclasses of users. Some of the users are doctors, some of the users are students, some of the users are administrators of courses. Uh, among the students, we have students in first year, students in second year. Um, we have certain types of resources. Some of these resources are kind of course material. Some of the resources are optional material for a multimedia material. Some of the resources are quizzes. Some of the resources are assessments. Uh, among the resources that are assessments, there are some attached resources which happen to be the grade somebody obtained on how many times they try, how long they took to represent it. Which means then we can obtain a domain specific view of all these things because we can start querying the domain specific aspect of the data simply out of uh, keeping the generic common meaning of what a log is and adding into it what is specific to the, to the platform and still carry on doing exactly the same level of analytics but making it meaningful to somebody working in that particular platform. So that's kind of a completely unreadable view of the ontology we use, the generic one. And, uh, and that's another view which is basically, again, it's another analytics platform that does exactly the same thing but using another system. And again, the only thing that differs between this one and the previous one, apart from the colors and uh, some of the organization, is that it uses exactly the same process and exactly the same ontology to represent the generic common part of what it is that rep is represented in a log as things that are happening within a thing and adds an additional layer of domain-specific thing into, in that case, interaction with, um, with university websites uh, in order to be able to do more domain-specific analytics of everything that's going on. Um, there is also one 
interesting difference we hear. I mean, in, not a difference, but there is also the aspect of um, having this additional element of reasoning, the third rule of uh, ontologies, which is we, because we add this domain-specific ontology, because we can express specific types of resources or specific type of activities, and because we can express explicitly what should be the implications of these things, then um, we can start doing analysis which are on these implications in addition to what is uh, explicitly expressed in the, um, in, uh, in the data. <coughs> and in a sense, it is this idea that the ontology is a way to express the meaning of the data as well as to add background knowledge into it that makes it meaningful and understandable. To give you a very simple example, the logs, the data, originally tells us one guy access a certain URL at a certain time. And that's mostly what we get from the logs. Now, the background knowledge we add into that, I mean, sorry, the first layer is the, genetic log, the generic log algorithm, uh, ontology, gee, I'm, I'm tired today, uh, is telling you that this line in the logs is an event that involves a certain agent, the user, uh, and is related, uh, expressing an activity from this agent into consulting a certain uh, resource which is located at this URL at a certain time. So it's very similar to the reading experience database ontology we said before. It's, there is an event, it involves somebody at a time, and it happens so that in a log, this event is of a specific time which is consulting a certain resource. Here we add background knowledge into what the different resources mean. So that, for example, we know that from the people who make the system that certain resources are forums and certain resources are blogs, and that certain resources in forums are about adding something into a forum and certain resources in uh, blogs are about just reading an article. By integrating that into our background knowledge ontology, our domain-specific ontology, it means that then we can create new meaning for uh, activities, for events, which is explicitly expressing the fact that an event that consists in going into a certain resources, which is the uh, add comment space into a blog, is, represents an activity of uh, contributing to, uh, to a blog resources, to a certain kind, I mean, it's an activity of contributing, which happens to be contributing to a certain type of resources. Which means that out of the raw data we have, we can infer from the background knowledge we have in, uh, in the domain-specific ontology more information and more meaning about the specific data we have. Which means, again, that we can query it so that we can get specific activities. So we can get from basic raw lines of logs into um, asking for what it is that a certain user has been contributing to or what it is that a certain user has been reading, or how well did somebody do at a certain assessment? Because the ontology expresses how to recognize these specific types of events compared to the others. And it can get much, much more sophisticated than that. It's, so that slightly going out of the log analysis element, but that's to explain the reasoning bit. Uh, that is <laughs> a system we are currently developing with the idea that, well, I guess a, a good, a significant proportion of everybody is on Facebook. And, uh, and you know that Facebook has this uh, graph API, which turns out to be very similar to linked data in some respects. And uh, it, is, it is a very interesting thing. Now, the interesting thing about it is then we can take it, make it actually link data, and start trying to understand what data in Facebook means. And in that particular case, what is interesting, uh, is interesting to us is that 
we can start trying to understand uh, what can be inferred from the raw data which happen to be in Facebook uh, from other people. So basically, what can be understa understood from a specific things? And again, that expressed this idea that we can use ontologies and possibly a tiny bit more. To our, uh, uh, or, or in particular, we can use reasoning pro automatic reasoning procedures to automatically process um, raw data which has hidden meaning and extract something which is more meaningful out of it. <coughs> the idea here, so I mean actually I can show you what it does and then I show you how it does it, is we can get from the graph protocol all sort of information about people, what they have posted and everything. Um, and again, you can just get that. You can see that you have posted things and there are photos tied with you and that some of the photos are located in a certain space or at least are geolocated and uh, they include other people and you are friend with somebody and somebody might be friend with somebody else. There are all sorts of things like this. This is the raw data we are dealing with. Uh, what this is trying to say, to show is in one thing what you can infer from that. Some of the things are absolutely completely obvious. Like, um, the, there are people you are friends with. That kind of Facebook tells you, so that's kind of very much obvious. Uh, it also allows you to infer other people you know because, for, because of things like you have been tagged in pictures with them. So if you have been in a picture with them, there is a good likeliness that you might know them. And it can also tell you about all sorts of other people which somehow appear in your Facebook data but you might not even know at all. Uh, it tells you about the pictures that include you and it tells you about the places where you have been because you have tagged things, pictures with these particular places or because you were tagged in pictures in these particular places. It can also tell you uh, with who you were in some places. Like, you know, it tells me that, uh, for example, I was in Segovia with, or in Spain, actually, no, in Sensedia with a guy called Oscar Gorsho. The, and that's what the ontology based reasoning can tell you is you take the raw data and you can express um, the meaning of this data. And especially the meaning that being a friend is something that happens between two people. And it happens to be reciprocal. So that means if you are a friend with somebody, you can infer that somebody is a friend with you. That's what is clear on Facebook. Uh, you can express that uh, you might know people. And knowing somebody is something that, express between, that happens between two people. And actually that you can infer that if you're a friend with somebody, you actually know them. That's kind of, in principle, uh, something that works well. You can express that if a picture is geotagged in Facebook, then the things which is geotagged happens to be a place. And things happen at places. And somebody, a person, can be at a place. And that's what we get out of the ontology. Now, the nice thing about this project is also that we go a step further, which is we also try to infer out of what we can get out of the, the data plus the ontology what other people might know about what can be inferred in the thing. So that's the second panel where that happens to be my wife. And uh, I add into that something which is called epistemic logic reasoning so that well, you know, from, from the ontology, it's pretty easy to know that my wife has taken pictures. And these happen to be pictures where I'm tagged in. But <coughs> what's more interesting is that then we can use a completely standard inference mechanism just out of Facebook to know what are the pictures she will know about. Out of, because these pictures have been, uh, has been shared by her has been shared by friends of her and were uh, visible to her friends or 
because I'm tagged in them and she happened to be one of my friends. It's kind of funny that my wife is one of my friends. That's kind of normal. And um, here I can infer what are the people my wife knows I know. That's kind of... Uh, so, for example, she knows that I know this uh, especially pretty girl there. She, and we might be able to explain that, wh how that comes from. And she, we can infer what she will know about the places I've been to. And actually, with who I've been to these places. By simply being able to infer from the photos she knows, and I was tagged in these photos, and where these photos were, that I happened to have been in Spain with somebody she might never have known about. So that is a basic explanation here. That is the whole point of the semantics part, of adding the ontology and then adding even more to the ontology that express the meaning of basic data, is that then we can process the data. And it remains the same level of data. What I do here is still Sparkle querying, but I do it out of data which add an inference and a meaning express by first adding an ontology that expresses what the data mean within the system and then adding um, some form of theory of how, um, how whatever I say on Facebook it might be end up being known by somebody else which is not an obvious thing. So that's a kind of an extract of the sort of things you get as the ontology, uh, expressing, for example, that there might be things like a person or application which are agent, things that happen on Facebook or that do things. And there are posts, and posts can be status update, photos, videos, and they, are they might be located in a certain place, and somebody might comment, and a person might be including in a post, I forgot to put the person might be including in a comment, and there might be apps which are other agents, which may also be author of posts because they are agents, so they may be author of posts. Um, that is a very simple and easy thing. Uh, but out of that, we, is, you know, out of that is the, fir, the three roles of the ontology. We take Facebook data, which is purely specific to Facebook, and we make it in a way which is processable generically as talking about any kind of agent and knowing that any kind of agent might do any kind of post which happen to be documents and might be located in any kind of place and that being able to apply generic processes to this specific data. We also then can imply new things. We can uh, infer things out of this ontology. And then that's the part which is not officially semantic web technologies but that adds to it is that then once we can infer things for example, that uh, a certain person is, a, is an author of something. Then uh, we can look at how to manipulate the knowledge these things have. So that's out of some form of epistemic logic where you can express that somebody, not only that something is true, but that somebody knows that something is true. So these are very simple rules that express the sort of epistemic theory of Facebook. These are the only examples, but the first one is the most obvious one. If somebody is the author of a post, they know about it. That's uh, rather obvious. So if A is the author of X, X knows that X is a post. Uh, a knows that X is a post, sorry. Uh, and <coughs> the second one is also kind of an obvious one in Facebook. It's a post is given for scope friends, so if you kind of expose something to all your friends and A is your friend, then A will know about the post. That's kind of very obvious. This sort of thing starts being a tiny bit more funny, is if um, a post includes somebody um, and, well, if the post includes somebody and was in a certain place, or is geotagged with a certain place, and a, the agent A, knows about the post, then A will know what, that uh, the person X, no, the person Y, was in that particular place. 
So that's how I can infer, for example, that my wife knows that I was in Spain. Uh, hopefully she knows in other ways, but in certain, in certain cases that might be a problem. Um, the, and the last one is the same thing, is we can infer that uh, somebody was with somebody else somewhere, uh, if, well, we can infer that A knows that, if A knows about a post where both were included. Now, <coughs> the funny thing is that, again, this is a funny thing of reasoning, is that this can be infer inferred out of the guy being friends, or, or A being friend of uh, the author of the post and the author of the post uh, making the post available to his friends, or out of being friends with one of the two people. Um, but the, both the ontology and the epistemic rules are a way to express the meaning of these things so that you can get the inference that tell you something more interesting and more meaningful out of the raw data. Um, what time is it? Okay, we still have a bit of time. Uh, do you, just checking if there is any, any questions uh, at, at this stage or, or we just carry on? Yes. Um, no, that's, <laughs> that's the basic answer. Um, because, I mean, these are, are, are some of the simple rules. But wh what we want to express is how much, I mean, what the agent A here knows about this rather than uh, the knowledge of this straight away. So what we want to say is Marilyn knows that Mathieu was with Valentina. Uh, not, not, I mean, the inference that Mathieu was with Valentina comes from the basic logic. But the, uh, the epistemic logic tells you what somebody knows about something. And you can get much, much more complex than that. The interesting bit becomes where, for example, you imagine somebody comments on a picture um, of, on, on a picture which was, on, which was uh, sorry, published for friends, so with a scope friends. So somebody is a friend with somebody else, so somebody else posts a picture scope for friends, some, uh, yet another somebody else comments on it. Then you can put a rule that will end up inferring that the, the first somebody the, the, uh, will then can infer or can know that the third somebody is friend with the one posted the picture. So that they are kind of friends with each other. Uh, and this basic rule will, be, will involve a lot of knowledge operators that the um, you, in order to infer that the guy commented his friend with the other guy, you have to know the picture. You have to know that the picture has been scoped with friends, and then you can know that the guy is friend with the other. And the, funny, and the nice thing about epistemic logic is that it can go in lots of recurrent ways, in a sense that then the third guy can infer that you know so they can know that you know that he's friend with the other one. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, that the basic point here is that it's not always from, you know, grounded information. You know, starting from grounded information, starting from facts, basically, then you know, to infer the information. Yeah, but I mean, it's why I have these two levels. There is a kind of, the basic, um, the common truth, the universal truth that I know somebody or I was with somebody. And the additional level of epistemic logic is how much a specific agent will know of, uh, of this common uh, altogether tr truth, which, um, which adds an, in an interesting level of, uh, of, um, of reasoning. And the point is, 
these universal truths, we get it out of the ontology, out of interpreting the data. And then we can add epistemic operators on top of whatever we infer from the ontology to know what anybody will know about anything, which is an interesting thing. And anybody else? Okay. So I'm, I'm getting into the kind of last part of the talk, which is kind of talking about getting a bit of a step further, in the sense that so far we have talked about things that are somehow officially semantic web technologies. The linked data, RDF, URIs, querying, Sparkle, ontologies and reasoning, or especially ontology reasoning. The epistemic part is kind of a parenthesis because I like it. Um, all that is what really makes the kind of the semantic web stack is components you might want to use if you want to build a semantic web system. Um, however, there are lots of other things. And these lots of other things are additional processing, additional levels of, um, well, clever processes, things coming from artificial intelligence, information extraction, uh, uh, recommender systems, information retrieval, that are common processes used on data, information, and knowledge, but that then you can apply with added benefit on linked data and semantic web knowledge. Uh, and I wanted to introduce some of, you know, the sort of things that are, it can make a difference to use semantic web information into these sort of processes as kind of their base uh, source of, uh, of information to build more intelligent systems. So one very simple example of that is that you can start by using basic graph processing. As explained before, the all of linked data and the all of uh, the semantic web is no more than a graph of data objects, knowledge objects, classes, types, relations, and all these sort of things. Uh, this is a very simple example where you can use this information of the links and try to understand something which is at a bit of a higher level. This is not very clear, quite obviously. Uh, this is, for example, a, a graph of data sources in linked data from educational providers. And the idea is that they all connect in one way or another. And in particular, in this case, they connect by what, what they talk about, what ontologies they use, what classes they are talking about, which, are, which is represented here. A lot of them will talk about places, organization, a lot of them will talk about students, a lot of them will talk about books and, um, and course material or research outputs or anything like this. Um, so the idea is that we can actually take a meta-level view of all this data and try to understand you know, how these different providers f talk about different things or the same thing. Uh, what are the main important topic in education? How uh, you can look at different providers for different types of information by simply using uh, a, a graph algorithm, a graph partitioning algorithm, which will tell you they seem to be this sort of guys and this sort of guys and this sort of guys. These ones over there tend to talk a lot about um, course material and educational resources. These down there tend to talk about, a lot about research outputs. These over there talks about the buildings and the student organization. And this is, you know, these are the three topics we can find in data of um, uh, in, in, in education. And that's out of using very simple graph processing algorithm out of data which is just on the web and using their connections through ontologies as the uh, essential part of the graph. Um, there are other, you know, a, lot, a very common other type of processes that tries to uh, use linked data in one way or another um, is in combining structured and unstructured information, is in trying to do some form of text processing by using data that comes from the web and try to connect things. This also relates a bit to recommend a system in one way we'll see. This is a, a nice little system we uh, developed in collaboration with the BBC, 
Actually, I will show it to you, and then you will see what it does. Um, so, you, this is a very simple thing that, uh, no, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, if you go to, to the BBC, well, they have pages for all their programs, and uh, there is iPlayer, which is a catch-up bit for the BBC, which means you should be able to watch any program that was broadcasted in uh, the last seven days uh, on there. And the idea of this system was to, think, to say, could we, if, say, if you're interested in a particular program and you, want, you will want to study at a university, how can we use this program to express your interest? Say, if I kind of, I'm very interested in geopolitics, because, and I've seen this program, and I thought it was really fascinating. Does the university have anything that can tell me more about, well, this particular thing? So what we did is this kind of rather simple bookmarklet here that you can just click, and basically it will, it will add this little window here that uh, connects you to open educational resources uh, from the Open University that kind of talk about the same thing. So this one, it says, it's also about geopolitics. And that's one piece of open educational resource about geopolitics. And you, know, you can just start reading it, basically. Um, that's a podcast on also on geopolitics related to 9-11 specifically in that case. Yeah, it's a guy who is talking. Um, there is a lot about international relationship. There are things about the US, um, about Europe and, and you know, economic future and this sort of thing. So what's interesting is that it takes whatever it can get from the program and create a connection between this program and uh, other resources. And that seems to be a reasonably common thing to do. There are two interesting things related to what we are talking about here in what that does. One is both the BBC and the Open, uh, the Open University provide information about these resources as linked data, which means that's one of the key elements that makes that we can get information about the program and we can get information about the resources we have and create a connection. The connection is, however, created not directly out of link data. It's created out of analyzing the text that describes the program and the text that describes the thing. And the analysis is done through a third source of link data, through DBpedia, which is basically extracting the Wikipedia article that seem to be most relevant to each of the resource and recommending the one that seems to be most connected. And what, what that makes is that first, when we recommend something, when we show a resource, we can say why. Because it's also here about geopolitics. Geopolitics is, a, is in that case, a DBpedia URI coming from the Wikipedia article about geopolitics. And it had found out that the BBC program and the this resource are both about geopolitics and many other things. The nice thing it gives us as well is that we can customize things. In the sense that clearly, yes, I was interested in the Sino-American relations. That's important. Uh, I'm not actually interested in, uh, in the BBC, so let's put that there. North America, yes, but not as much. Editing, not at all. And the travel of Marco Polo, no care. But really what I want to do is geopolitics. Uh, I don't care about the presidency of Barack Obama, and I care about China. Let's keep that for now, and cooperation, because that's a big part of geopolitics. And then I can customize the actual algorithm to create the connection so that I get exactly what I want out of um, this particular operation. So now I get more things about cooperation. It happens to be exactly one which was there as well before, but putting more emphasis on collaboration, cooperation now, um, and getting 
other resources that relate to things I, uh, I'm interested in. So, now again, so that's the basic thing. And as, as I showed, you, could, you can customize it. So that was in another example on a program called the Dragon's Den, which is most, uh, mostly about entrepreneurship and these sort of things. People giving money away, basically. And not really saxophones. Um, the reason why I'm showing it here, rather than in the link data part, is that, is that the whole idea is that it, it does use link data, but it does an intermediary thing. And link data is used for the flexibility of it and for the fact that it will provide information, uh, intermediary information. And that basically the whole process is taking some data about resources, getting some data about a program, and then getting all the data from DBpedia that will form an intermediary connecting them. You know, big, basically by saying this talks about that and this talks about that as well and then creating a semantic index of these specific URIs with spe these specific topics from DBpedia. And uh, once this is created, it becomes a completely normal and common information retrieval process, which will, from a set of topics, retrieve the resources which have the most similar set of topics. Now, interestingly enough, the whole point of that is um, because we start by taking information about linked data, the whole index happens only at URI. The only thing we index are URIs. And we don't really have to care what they are and where they come from. And because the indexing, the words used for indexing, are also taken from linked data and also intermediary through the name entity recognition system that tells us which index, uh, which uh, URI we should use, that means that the entire index is basically an index of URIs indexed by URIs. Which means the entire thing then ends up being, given a certain URI, tell me about uh, what other URIs you know that seems to be similar based on other URIs. Which means that the whole process becomes completely generic and obvious. When arriving at the interface level, showing all the information and showing information about what they have in common and understanding the topics that they talk about has nothing to do with this. It is all on querying linked data straight away out of the sources by getting what we, whatever we get. Whenever we get a resource, we can know where it's located, we can know what information we have about it out of querying data open in UK. We can query the BBC to get information about the program and we can query DBpedia to get information about the topics that connect them. Which means also that then that means we can do it on all sorts of other things. Uh, this is exactly the same system, except with a completely different interface, where you can start typing some words over there. Uh, actually, I should be able to show it to you as well. Do, 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 do. This one? Yes. You, you type a text here, and again, it tells you what sort of... Pro, um, what, what's the topic of your text? And that's all out of DBpedia URIs. And, um, and it tells you about open educational resources that might relate to the topic of your text. And again, being able to customize that and actually look at them. Oh, this is so pretty. Um, and say, we don't really care that much about the visit. Tup, go, and, and he will do it again. Ta-da, here we go. Um, so that's the same index, completely different process, taking the original query in a completely different way. Um, we have another one where we applied exactly the same thing on an index of, of course material with an of open educational material. I can't show it to you because it's closed and within our own thing. But again, we created link data, not available link data, for our course material because we can't provide it, but we can still make it related to courses and make it related to whatever open data we have. And we create an index out of the same thing so that we can apply exactly the same process to find course material. And in that case, the point is a lecturer creating a new course might want to look into 
what the matter, what was the, the material, the books used in the previous course. In that case, uh, we take a course on science, uh, on introduction to science, and we can directly go into the, uh, actually the scan pages of the books, out of putting a text that say uh, something about a specific scientific topic. Um, and the, again, the interesting thing is, it's just a matter of interface then. Is because we have linked data and we have the generic process that uh, processes it, you can use exactly the same engine to do any kind of thing and creating a new use case and a new scenario for it becomes completely obvious. Um, I have another example here of, of connecting semantic web information with some text processing and natural language processing, which is a system we developed quite a long, uh, a long time ago, which was basically doing question answering out of semantic web resources. And I don't going to spend a lot of time, but basically it does a very obvious thing you would think about, which is you type a question and it finds places on the semantic web that seem to give some element of answers to, uh, to that question and then give you the, uh, the answer. Again, this is a standard process. This is something that has happened all over every time. The main difference here is that it applies a specific process, analyzing the question up to a certain point, which is it creates some form of triple patterns from it. And then out of that, it becomes a generic process of um, matching these triple patterns into semantic web resources, whatever and wherever they come from. And as soon as you can do that, whatever resources might appear at some point is naturally integrated into your system because you don't have to provide the answers to the system in your own knowledge base or in your own database, and you don't have to provide it in a specific format. What this is doing is finding, you know, analyzing the question to transform it into a way where it can match any kind of ontology or linked data sources on the web. And um, that makes it much easier to maintain, I can tell you, because basically you don't have to tell it anything. Um, I think I'll pass this one. And the other one, the other kind of generic uh, process I wanted to mention, and that could be of interest, is basically any form of data mining. The, again, data mining, not officially a semantic web technology. But um, there is an idea that, well, data mining use data as input. And there is an element that, well, the linked data is quite obviously full of data. And there is this idea that semantic web technologies can be integrated into a data mining process at many different levels. One is, yes, you can take some data and mine them. Somehow, this is what we do with student enrollment. And, um, and because we have linked data sources, we can make this data richer, or we can aggregate them in a way that makes sense, because we can bring some additional dimensions into the data uh, that comes from connecting them to linked data. The other thing is that you can use ontologies as a way to understand and kind of, as a way to connect whatever you find to whatever meaningful information you might have. And the last thing is, in, in, in this particular example, you can use data mining on data that connects to linked data, and then use this information to try to interpret whatever you come up with. Um, with the idea that you might be able to find an awful lot of patterns, an awful lot of information in a very specific core database. But then, once you have found this pattern, you can try to connect whatever they relate to into whatever information you might have somewhere else on the semantic web in order to uh, make them interpretable or group them or understand them or navigate them. The examples we use here is we, we had a database of, we have the database of, um, that came from a French hospital of 
what treatment and what diseases people have had when coming to the hospital. So basically, patient trajectories. And this was all annotated according to a specific classification of uh, diseases and treatments from, well, that comes from uh, the French uh, healthcare community. So that was all a French specific classification. And then we obtain frequent trajectory. You know, people who come with this particular disease often they get this treatment, then they come back for checking and uh, they get this other treatment. Uh, and we get all sorts of these things. But the French, the French classification doesn't tell you any more than, you know, well, this is a code for a specific disease. Now, so what we can do then is we take all this frequent trajectory and, uh, and all this classification maps into ontologies from other places uh, of diseases and treatments. And we can start group and organize the trajectories we have found into diseases from, uh, and treatment from other, uh, for example, American classifications, as well as use the information we have about these treatments and diseases to group and understand the, um, the specific trajectories. And understanding, for example, because you know, we uh, understand that a particular trajectory which is having a certain, uh, um, a certain treatment for a disease which happen in, um, in a certain part of the body and then coming back and have, uh, having another treatment happening in another part of the body is explained through another ontology somewhere by saying that this treatment might have certain complications which will affect this other part and by reusing the information that comes out of that. So in a sense is, uh, what I'm saying is there are all these sort of very clever things in that somehow you can integrate the information from linked data in the semantic web into the process at, at a number of, of various dedicated points. Um, I had another part, but I frankly, I'm keen to skip it. And just to summarize by saying, um, there is another interesting aspect, which is about the idea that semantic web technologies, you know, as we've seen, they have this interesting element of being global, being universal, being connected, and uh, enabling reasoning, and en enabling clever processing inform of information. The there is one additional interesting aspect about them is the one of being self-reflective and self-descriptive, that you can look into them in a common form, in a common way, which means you can crawl all sorts of data and you can actually do meta-analysis of the data rather than uh, directly on, upon the data. And that's the sort of thing that becomes very interesting when you start to understand questions like the one you asked originally, you know, how are different data provenance and data provider might relate to each other? How different sources of the same data might have different aspects to them, which are not what they express. It might not even be how correct they are, but maybe how granular they are, what can we do with them, how we can actually understand what can be done. Um, we, had, we had interesting work in this area into understanding what, you know, for example, what the level of sophistication in the ontology language that was used in all sorts of different ontologies, as well as what were the topics of different ontologies. <coughs> and similarly, one thing we were looking at is, you know, taking all sorts of different sources and especially ontologies, trying to understand actually are they saying the same thing? Do they agree? Do they disagree? Are they consistent? And that starts getting interesting for what I was saying before, which is uh, it is important that we can not only take data and use it, but that we can understand the context in which the data has been produced and the particular view it represents because we can't assume everybody to say the truth all the time. And actually we can't assume the truth to be true independently of any context. So having a way to manipulate data at this level uh, becomes very interesting. Uh, and it's become interesting also because then we can integrate that into our own 
elements. Um, so I will conclude now uh, by giving a, 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 very, a very simple summary. Um, I said I wanted to show, uh, to, to structure this presentation according to this stack. My idea is, well, the, the interesting property of the web of uh, anything else that happened before that is that it abstracts and it abstracts globally. It, it represents what it needs to represent, which is the document and its connection to other document, independently of the lower technical layer. And I think this is what linked data achieves for data, and this is what the semantic web achieves for knowledge. And then we can add interesting processes that exploits that without having to care about all the uh, stack going down. So it becomes a bit like the Aussie model. The Aussie model is here, or the only, uh, Aussie stack. Uh, and then we get, you know, we get through the web as the connection model through linked data as a data model and through a semantic web as a knowledge model so that we can have an application model over there which is intelligent without having to uh, bother about the source and the uh, technicalities of providing data. Um, I hope that through the kind of the few examples I've shown you, I mean, the lot of examples I've shown you, I, I, I have passed the main message which is the semantic, semantic web technologies are not about the specific acronym that are used and the specific type of technology and the specific you know, arbitrary choice made into the syntax or the way it's formalized. It's into what fundamentally it brings into the development of smart systems. And what that is, is, at the, is from, the t from the bottom to the top, is this idea that uh, everything can be, un can be decentralized, can be global, and you can bring information independently of uh, technical elements, that me meaning that you can process data that naturally integrates globally um, without having to bother about the technicalities of it. And you can apply smart technologies and start doing things that are at the level of knowledge-based systems and of artificial intelligence with information which is larger scale and more distributed and more collaborative than whatever has ever existed. And, and that is one, very exciting, second, very challenging. Um, it makes it possible to do things that were not possible before because of the cost of collecting all the information being reduced dramatically and being reduced to just accessing the web. It makes it challenging because, as we know, the web is not a perfect system. The web, the web is not the universal truth, and the universal truth does not exist. It makes it also much more flexible and much more easy for anybody who developed these sort of systems to maintain and understand because of making the web the knowledge infrastructure and the data infrastructure for, um, for everybody to use. And I will wait for the picture to be taken. Uh, I, you know, I will put the slides online. You should be fine. <laughs> OK. Um, and yeah, and just a tiny bit about the future. I really like your question at the beginning, because basically it says everything I wanted to say, um, is that there is still an element that the uh, semantic web technologies are still at the level of the stack. They are still very much looking at the symbol level of how you represent query access data and how you express schemas and vocabularies about them. It becomes very important to get to this meta level and to get to understand actually what is a process and to get to be able to annotate data providers and to annotate data processes according to what is actually being done about the data. You know, there is this uh, funny word called paradata in the, and it, it has two different meanings in two different areas, which is quite terrible. Uh, but the nice meaning, the, not the one in learning analytics, so the one in, uh, the general meaning in social sciences is, for paradata is information 
about not, I mean, information about the collection of data. Is if you are a social scientist and you are making a survey, the paradata about the, the data of the survey is a result, whatever you have obtained and whatever people have answered. The paradata about the survey is how this has been collected, how many people were interrogated, where they came from, how, you, how did you do? Did you go on the street? Did you do online? Did you set up a system? What is the way data is being collected? And that is fundamentally important in this sort of scientific area because it tells you what you can do with the data. It tells you how much you can trust it. It tells you how much you know, care has been taken in collecting it. And it makes it comparable to other data, which might say something completely different, but tries to explain in, through the process why this difference might have appeared. And I think we need something similar as part of semantic web technologies. The provenance vocabulary it might be uh, an element of that. But we need, in addition to that, anything that can express more of the context of the data and more of the competence of data. So that to be able to tell a system actually getting and using it um, what it can do with it and how, what it can do safely with it whether the data has been tampered with in any way, whether it's restricted in time, whether it's an aggregation of other data, whether it has been filtered. All these sort of elements become really important as soon as we assume that any information on the semantic web will be exploited uh, automatically without the need for human intervention. Uh, which means also formalizing the level of the practice of what it is, is being done. If you find a semantic web application, what is it that this semantic web application does? What processes it exploits? Which means that the top layer of a there also needs to be formalized. Uh, there was an area called semantic web services at some point, which tried to get into that sort of things, which is annotate the processes uh, using data and ontologies in addition to the, one, to the actual data and ontologies. Uh, I really was focusing on what the processes can provide. Well, and actually it died. Nobody cares about it anymore. Um, what I'm saying here is that what we need to is a way to express what is being done on data. What is it that a certain process is a way it transforms the data and provide it in a different way. Uh, so to create kind of standard processes for the development of intelligent semantic web systems. Uh, I think that's all I had to say and hopefully you might have more questions and of course I mean I didn't put any reference in the slide because it would have taken all the space but uh, there is a couple of my web pages over there uh, I said one the, the two advantages of using my own examples were that it makes me it makes it easy to be lazy and I know about them but it also means that if there is anything on which you might want more detail, you can go to my publication page and you should be able to find a couple of papers on the specific thing I've been talking about here. Uh, and otherwise, I'm, I'm very happy to receive questions, uh, whether now or through later contacts, through emails on, on Twitter or anything like this. Thank you very much. So maybe if there are some questions now, or um, we can stop. I have actually I have two questions, but maybe one is quite technical, so maybe we can talk about it later. The other one is like um, the one I, I'm asking to everyone, which is maybe the main focus of all our intent of, of meeting this, uh, making this workshop, is what's your idea on how to uh, merge, or maybe what can uh, knowledge knowledge-based models can get from um, distributional and, and statistical models, or what can statistical models get and, uh, uh, from knowledge-based models and merge them together in some way? What's your idea about that? First, that you like tricky questions. <laughs> you, you like making my life difficult. Um, it's a common question, and I actually, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure I have an answer. Because we, we keep saying that, uh, I'm trying to find the right place so that it doesn't last. And, um, 
we keep saying that it's an important thing, and I can say that there have been a lot of, uh, I mean, there have been recently some uh, initiatives into represent, I mean, representing statistical information within linked data and semantic web systems. Um, but I don't think that answers your question, because I think the question is really on, no, the semantic web is based on knowledge-based systems. Most of the rest of the web is based mostly on statistical systems, including Google and any kind of search engines. And this seems to be completely separated and uh, unrelated type of reasoning. You know, you can do statistical reasoning, which is mostly finding out about the statistical property of data, or you could do knowledge-based reasoning. Uh, my answer is I don't think they need to be integrated because I don't think they are that different. I mean, I don't... They are different in the sense that they don't give the same type of results. But I don't think fundamentally in the process they are different, in the sense that um, statistical analysis is about analyzing corpus of data. And the, a bit like in, the, in my slides about data mining, um, there are many different places in which, in this particular process, you might integrate ontology-based knowledge and uh, linked data-based reasoning. You, you don't need to make them the same. You don't need to get the ontology reasoning being part of the statistical reasoning. What you need to do is, within the process that leads to a statistical reasoning uh, um, result, integrate the right level of information and of background knowledge and of ontological reasoning, so to make it more uh, sensible. And similarly, you can do exactly the contrary, which is uh, a bit like in, in my student enrollment example. Um, you can use statistical statistics-based processes to re-aggregate the data in order then to be able to make sense of them at the level of uh, an ontology-based system. So I think it's not, what I'm saying there is no difference is I think they well, my answer is, I don't think we should put a specific effort in integrating them in a sense that they are not, you know, uh, separated areas which you can't work out separ uh, together and that are always worked out separately. They, each of them includes techniques and uh, elements that can integrate at the level of a process and that there is no reason why this, one, this can't happen. Um, of course, this is probably a naive answer. Yeah? Are there any more questions? Could you just tell us what is your idea about what is going on uh, with the schema.org initiative and, you know, the relation with the semantic web initiative, just, you know, to, to tell them what's going on out there? At all. Um, I would like it better if you answered the question. Uh, <laughs> now, I mean, I, I tend to ignore it a tiny bit because there is this element that, so just as a summary in case you don't know, um, there is this idea that the, the big um, semantic webs, uh, so, sorry, the big search engines on, on, on the web, Google, Bing, Yahoo, and I think also the Russian one, which I forget, Yandex, uh, have come together to create what they call schema.org, which is mostly some form of a schema to annotate web resources and web pages so that the search engine can uh, provide better information about it. And I'm explicitly, in that description, not using the word ontology because it is one, but it is not the way they want to think about it. What they have created is what they call a schema, and which, is, which has the purpose of creating ways to annotate uh, web pages. Um, what, as semantic web researchers, we look at that and we say, hey, they have created an ontology. 
hey, this is an ontology to make sense of web resources, and hey, it is using URIs and all sort of things like this, so it must be linked data. Um, and that's the main reason why I don't like the question, because um, they didn't create it as being linked data, and fundamentally it is. Uh, it has a major difference, which is it is not open in a sense that you are expected to use their specific vocabulary and you are not expected, you can't, in principle, in their processes, use it in, in connection with other ontologies. But in reality, what you can do is use any kind of linked data process and connect that to schema.org as well. So it's why I really dislike the question. Because I can't figure out myself, I can't form an opinion on whether I should think of schema.org as being part of linked data or not. And uh, the more controversial question, which is, should we re really bother about having any other ontology or any form of linked data since they are the big web giants and they did it? Uh, on the second one, I can guarantee the answer is, even if we shouldn't bother, uh, I will carry on. Um, there is, you know, Schema.org has been created for a specific purpose by specific companies. And one of the important properties of linked data and the web is that it is not for a specific purpose and a specific company. And it has this element of openness and contribution from whatever form it comes from uh, embedded in it. Um, whether Schema.org is linked data and uh, should be considered as such is anyway, I think, a question that doesn't need to be answered. It's not, an important, it's not the important part of it. Uh, the important part of it is that it gives yet another resource that demonstrates how structured data on the web is useful and can connect to the other uh, usual processes of the web which don't traditionally exploit um, structured data, and how in a, whether or not it's linked data, it is going to create new sources of inform, structured information which is going to be exploitable as if it was. So in principle, that means it's just taking this big diagram I've been showing, it, showing before and at least doubling it, at least making it much, much bigger and much, much more complex. Um, I would be in, I would like it if uh, they will play well. I mean, I would like it if schema.org will end up being linked data for real. Uh, what I tend to, what, one reason why I tend to find it depressing is that it won't. And it will uh, carry on creating linked data in parallel to everybody else who is creating linked data. But that's life. Okay, so let's thank our speaker again. And see you at 2 and 13 p.m.